All right, good morning, everyone. We are going to get started today. Got Kaylin joining us virtually. Everyone else is here. Very nice, very nice. Let's uh, open up with prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for bringing us back safely from our uh, travels and fun times over the course of Thanksgiving. Uh, be with us today as we study more about you and your word. And, um, you know, we hear that we get to proclaim forgiveness to each other, which is a, an amazing blessing. Uh, be with us today and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before, oops, see what's joining us. Good morning, Sila. Can you hear us all right? I hope. We'll see. Um, before we get into any new material for today, we're going to continue on with some of our uh, previous materials. Um, what we talked about last time. Uh, any questions before we get into it? Yes. Yes. Um, Gabe. Do we have do we have confirmation class on Wednesday? We do. Confirmation 615 on Wednesday. Oh, I should clarify the schedule because I think I misled you last time we were together. The test is not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. This Wednesday will be the review for the test, um, which I have right here. So if you want to look at it beforehand, you can. Gabe, you want to pass those up for us, please and thank you. Just take one down and pass it around. Um, yeah, so review for the test is this Wednesday, the test will be next Wednesday. Uh, so we'll we'll do some fun to review. Not sure what yet. And uh, I'm preaching on this Wednesday. Well, I'm preaching all the Wednesdays. So this week I'll do the review with you, and then Pastor's going to come in and finish up the review. Uh, so I gotta you know make sure that we have worship starting on time, and then we'll just walk together to, to worship after that. Um, all right. Sila, can you hear us all right? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. We're, we already prayed, and now we know our schedule, and now let's get into what we're going to be talking about today. Um, this is some review from, from last week. We talked about people who are hypocrites. Uh, people who pretend to be Christians but don't actually believe. And then we talked about people who are orthodox. They are churches that teach God's word completely accurately. Uh, so this should just be review stuff. Um, and we would say we're orthodox. We teach the Bible and its truth and its purity. But there are some churches who are heterodox. What does heterodox mean? Gabe? They don't tell the Bible the complete truth about it. Yeah. A church that doesn't teach God's word accurately. They might still teach some amazing truths. They might still tell you about Jesus. And uh, they might have a lot of teachings that are correct, but not every one of their teachings is, is fully accurate. And we want to be accurate in what God's word says. Uh, God has given us his word for a reason. It's not something that we get to you know, decide how we want to interpret it, or we don't get to make the Bible say what we want to say. We've got to uh, stay pure to, to what God intends. Um, that's where we're going to kind of pick up today. We're going to do just a little bit more uh, talking about talking about this concept. Um, this is another kind of review question. How dangerous is someone who teaches God's word improperly? And so we're in our workbooks. We're still on lesson 17 for now. We're going to finish that up before we get into 18 today. Uh, how dangerous is someone who teaches God's word improperly? Everyone open up to lesson 17 before we get started. Everyone has their book today. Glorious, wonderful. Page are we on? Uh, 
All right, page 82. How dangerous is someone who teaches God's word improperly? Dave Emerson? Okay, there's someone who is sinning. All right. There's always a danger with sin, Gabe? Um, they're really dangerous, I guess, because they can potentially mislead someone away from God's actual word mm -hmm. and potentially like lead them to hell. Yeah. Yeah, scary as it is, uh, someone might teach a lot of good things about God's word, but um, maybe little minor, what they think are minor points of the Bible, they, they actually cause someone to fall from the faith, uh, lose their confidence. Uh, for example, last lesson or last series of lessons, last test, we talked about theistic evolution, the idea that some people have that God used evolution to create the world. Um, and they, some people might say, well, that's kind of a minor point of doctrine, uh, but it can be very powerful if someone goes out into the world and they start reading the science and they say, oh, wow, this is really backing up uh, evolution. They might turn from God and stray from his word, even though that church might teach about Jesus and how he died to forgive our sins. They're teaching theistic evolution and someone ends up falling from the faith. Um, we don't want that. Yeah, Gabe. Uh, I actually have a study. Um, I was over at the house today reading the Bible. Uh -huh. The Bible is what, about God, but there was one part that said, it was like an interesting fact about how we know he's there for millions of years, but when God did it, there's only six days and there's only 300 years. I was like, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did, did you get to talk to your friend about that then? Yeah, but it's, it's really hard to try to get him to, mm -hmm. to see it. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And remember, we, we had talked about um, how there's evening and morning and the word day means just, you know, 24 hours. Uh, so that's something you could share with them potentially. But uh, yeah, hopefully they, they come to understand that God created the world. And he did so in six days. Yeah. How dangerous. Um, it's very dangerous. A false teacher can threaten a person's eternal life. And this is one you don't necessarily have to write down. Um, Matthew 28, 19 through 20a. It's printed up there on the screen. Who will read that for us? Christian, will you read that for us, please? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. How much of God's word did Jesus command us to teach others? Some of it? No, all of it, of course. It's right there. We're supposed to teach everything. You can write that one down. 14, everything. Not just the parts that make us feel good or the parts that make sense to us, but everything. If we find a church that is not teaching God's word completely accurately, so if we find a church that is heterodox, what should we do with that church? Let's read Romans 16, 17. Uh, Max, will you read that one for us? I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in their way that are contrary contrary mm -hmm. to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. What should we do with such a church that teaches the wrong things? A, teach, a church that is causing divisions and putting obstacles in your way, what should we do with them? Gabe? Keep away from them. Keep away from them. Absolutely. We should keep away from it, that's the church, and go somewhere else. You can write this down in number 15. We should keep away from it and go somewhere else. should keep away from it and go somewhere else. It's not always an easy thing to do, uh, especially if you've been going to church for a long time. No. 
No. My, my hope is that Abiding Grace continues to teach God's word accurately. I think that it will. Um, but if there were a time when we stopped teaching God's word accurately, um, yes, you, you would you would try and explain to people what God's word does say. But if people are persistent, you might have to leave. That leads us into talking about church fellowship. Raise your hand if you've heard about church fellowship before. And, and not like, you know, we have a fellowship event like potluck or uh, you might say like, oh, soup supper is kind of a fellowship event, but church fellowship is something different. Has anyone heard about that or, or has any idea what we're talking about with that? Maybe not. Okay. That's okay. That's what we're here for to learn. Church fellowship is essentially this. Um, so you can write it down and then we'll talk about it. We join to work and worship with Christians with whom we have complete agreement on God's word. Go ahead and write this down. This is a term that is very important and it might be in the text. We join to work and worship with Christians with whom we have complete agreement on God's word. And you can look up and look at me whenever you're done writing. We join to work and worship with Christians with whom we have complete agreement on God's word. You can look up when you're done writing. like 15 more seconds we join to work and worship with christians with whom we have complete agreement on god's word and if um you don't get a chance to write something down there's definitions in the back of your catechism on page 375, and they're worded a little different than what we've got on the screen, but they're the same difference, essentially, okay? That is what church fellowship, that's a definition. Now we gotta talk about what it means to practice church fellowship. So basically, church fellowship is this. We would invite anyone to come worship with us at Abide in Grace, right? Um, we want someone who's never heard about Jesus to come in and, and sit and, and hear God's word. We also want people who are already Christians, but who come from a different church body. Maybe they're Baptist. We want them to come as well and learn God's word accurately. But when those people come, they're not members, right? They still have some different beliefs than what we have. And we don't want to give the idea that we believe exactly the same thing, right? Because we just said um, teaching God word we teach everything we want to teach people everything so if someone comes and they teach that baptism doesn't actually save you you know it's just something that you do it's just a symbol we would say that's wrong that's not how god's word says it and we know that baptism offers us the forgiveness of sin so that's where we differ right we've got two different beliefs ours is according to the bible and we want that person to keep coming so they can keep learning and growing but if we do stuff like invite them up to communion, what we're doing is publicly saying, oh, we are united. We are united in our beliefs. And we don't want that other person to have to confess what we teach and believe here until we get to teach them through confirmation or Bible information class. So we practice church fellowship. We'd love for them to come and worship with us, uh, but they're not going to come up for communion because that's a very intimate matter um, where we're confessing that, you know, God is giving us forgiveness in the Lord's Supper, but we're also joining with our fellow Christians. So it's a vertical and a horizontal 
relationship. Um, that makes sense. And this will also look like sometimes, um, you know how sometimes after something really bad happens, a group of churches will get together and they'll have like a prayer service and one pastor will stand up and pray and then another pastor will stand up and pray. You never experience something like this. It's something that that is somewhat common when tragedy occurs. You get a bunch of religious leaders together. It sounds really great, right? You get a bunch of Christians together and they can all worship. And it sounds awesome. And, um, you know, God has given us the privilege to worship with other believers. But we don't want to go to one of these events. Pastor wouldn't go and say a prayer along with, you know, a Methodist preacher and a Baptist preacher and a Unitarian preacher. Because then it would look like, oh, you all believe the same thing. And we don't. We have different beliefs and then they do. So we don't want to publicly say we agree when we don't. That's essentially what fellowship is. What are your questions with this? This is maybe something that's kind of new to you. I know it was new to me when I got to confirmation class. I thought, whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> Making some sense? Okay, good. Let's uh, get into it a little bit more. When we know that a person or a church is not teaching God's word accurately, what should we do for that person or church? Um, this is from Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. We memorized this verse, oh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Uh, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now here's where we're really uh, focusing until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and became and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. But obviously not every church has that. We don't all believe the same things. Now, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Um, you know, people who teach anything but God's whole word, they are being cunning and crafty and deceitful. Those are not positive words. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Um, we also see in Titus 3, 10 and 11, warn a divisive person once, that's someone who is, um, has a difference of opinion, and then warn them a second time. So if Pastor and I got up at church and we said something that wasn't in the Bible, if we said, uh, oh, communion, you only get the bread and the wine. Jesus' body isn't actually there. You'd come to us and say, hey, that's not in the Bible. That's not what the Bible says. Uh, so you'd warn us. But, but if we did it again, you'd warn us again. Um, but if we continue to teach that, and the whole church goes along with it. And everyone else says, oh, yeah, this is what God's word says. And you say, no, this isn't. Um, you would want nothing to do with us. You'd either kick that person out of the church if they're not going to repent. Um, or maybe you'd leave the church. Um, which is hard. So um, what should we do for that person or church who's not teaching God's word accurately? Warn them twice about, well, first time, if they don't uh, change, then do the same thing, and then just stop, like, it's literally what Travis just said, and what you just yeah. said, so. Yeah. Yeah, warn and correct the person or group in love, but if they don't listen, move on. You can write this down. You can just write, like, warn in love, if they don't listen, move on. A warning, correct the person or group in love, but if they will not listen, move on.
sometimes it might happen that someone in church misspeaks. Someone might give an answer in Bible study, and uh, you know maybe they slipped up how they spoke. Like uh, sometimes with the Trinity, it's kind of hard to talk about. It's such a confusing concept to us. Three persons, one God. Or pastor and I might misspeak. Uh, and that's not what we're talking about. This is someone who continues persistently in teaching contrary to the word of God. Uh, three reasons why we'd want to warn them. Concern for their souls, concerns for the people they teach, and uh, protect. And so we are protected from their teachings. So we care about the person who is teaching the wrong thing. We don't, we don't want them to have the wrong ideas. We are concerned about, you know, the people everyone else who's listening, and we're also concerned about ourselves. That's why we want to warn them. Three reasons we should warn them. For their sake, for everyone else's sake, for our sake. seconds. Concern for their souls, concern for the people they teach, and so we're protected from their teaching. Awesome. Um, why wouldn't we want to join other Christians for worship or for work in the church if we are not in full agreement with them? Why don't we go to these big prayer services? What do you think, Christian? Okay. Okay, okay, Bamerson. <clears throat> Yeah, we don't want to give the idea that we are united. Um, it would be kind of like saying, oh, having some errors in your teachings, oh, that doesn't matter. We don't want that. We understand that our teachings are important and errors do matter. So that would imply that errors don't matter, which is just not the case. Do some churches believe that just like literally nothing like matters that it's like other than that you believe in that you believe that Jesus died um, and rose from the dead yep. for all of our sins? Do some churches just believe that nothing else matters other than that? That's a really popular thing right now in the world, well, in, in America, in America. It's called the ecumenical movement. Um, it's this idea that as long as you're a Christian, that's all that matters. Um, it's been pretty popular the last 25-ish years. Before then, people were pretty concerned about teaching the right thing and sticking to whatever denomination they belong to. But now it's more cool to say, oh, we all believe in Christ, so let's join together. Um, that's a big thing. You probably hear that at some point. Uh, you probably have friends who are have this kind of idea, like, oh, we're all Christians, like we should do everything together, you know, the more the merrier, which sounds good, but uh, can be dangerous. Um, well, we already kind of answered this. We did this. Uh, let's get on to our new stuff. Any questions on what we've talked about yet today before we keep moving? Make sense so far? Awesome. Now we're going to get into something called the public ministry and the keys. The public ministry and the keys, lesson 18. Um, we're going to open up to John 8. 
verses 2 through 11. John 8. If you've got this Bible in here today, it's one thousand six hundred and twenty eight. If you're online, just go to Google and type in John 8, and it'll come up on Bible Gateway or something like that. John 8. You might see in your Bible that this is like italicized or there are some questions. Um, some versions of the Bible have this account in the book of Luke. So I'm kind of unsure if it's supposed to be in John or Luke. That's okay. It's still something that teaches us, helps us understand. Um, I don't know if we've got a different Bible right now. So for me, it's 1,628. For me, it's 1,176. So John 8, verses 2 through 11, we'll go around the room and each take a verse. I'll start with verse 2, then we'll go Max, verse 3, Christian, verse 4, and so on. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, that's Jesus, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman and adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Christian five. The law of Moses commands us to tell the children, not what Jesus said. Again, he scooped down and wrote on the ground. So verse 9, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing standing there. Max 10? Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Christian verse 11. No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and live your life of sin. Leave your life of sin. <laughs> yeah, not live your life of sin. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. Different message. Different messages, right? Uh, John... John 8, verses 2 through 11. This is the story where the Pharisees are going to. They find this woman who has committed adultery, which is a sin. That's bad. They ask Jesus if they can kill her, if they can stone her. They're really trapping Jesus because the Romans told the Israelites, only we have the power to kill. So Jesus said, yep, stone her. They can tell the Romans, hey, Jesus is telling people to, to kill. Uh, and the Romans would say, no, we, we said not to do that. But if Jesus says, nope, don't stone her, they would be breaking this law of Moses from Leviticus 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. 
So they were trying to trap Jesus. If he said, nope, don't kill her, uh, they could say, well, you're not listening to God. And if he said, yep, kill her, they could say, well, you're not listening to the Romans. But then Jesus, um, he, he gets them. He, he wins the day. Um, he forgives this woman instead. Uh, why might God have commanded such a harsh penalty for people who committed adultery? Gabe, what do you think? Okay, yeah, you're breaking a promise. Promises are serious. Yeah, he wanted the Israelites to understand the seriousness of sin. All sins deserve death, but this is a particularly harsh sin that was breaking faith with God by breaking faith with your spouse. So you can write this down in box number one. He wanted the Israelites to understand the seriousness of sin. Or you can just write down seriousness of sin. seriousness of sin. Uh, so we already kind of talked about this. The men tried to make it look like they were concerned about God's law. What were they actually trying to do? Well, they're trying to catch Jesus in a mistake. Um, so you can just try, you can just write like trapping Jesus. Something like that, trap Jesus. They're trying to trap Jesus. They didn't actually care about this woman. They just wanted to use her to, to get Jesus in trouble, essentially. All right, now we're going to go to John 18. Well, keep your Bibles open right here. Uh, who will read John 18.31 for us? Go for it, Gabe. Pilate said, take him, take him to yourselves and judge him by your own law. Under Roman rule in Jesus' day, what were the Jewish people not allowed to do? I already said it earlier. They weren't allowed to. Yeah, they weren't allowed to kill people. So you can just write execute. E-X-E-C-U-T-E. -E -E. Execute. That's all you got to write in the box. Nice and simple. Just the word execute. E-X-E-C-U-T-E. -E -E. Execute. That's all you got to write. Um, how could they have accused Jesus of wrongdoing if he said yes, put her to death? Okay. Uh, disobeying the Romans. Yep. Disobeying Rome. That's all you can. That's all you better do. Disobeying Rome. Disobeying Rome. And we know that we're supposed to obey the government. Even if the government is evil. Disobeying Rome.
Um, and they could have accused Jesus of wrongdoing if he said, no, don't kill her because, what do you think, Max? If Jesus said, don't kill her, what could they have said? Then you're breaking in someone's laws. Whose laws? Moses. Yeah, God's laws through Moses. Yep. You can just write God's laws. Or break God's laws. Break God's laws. Obviously, Jesus wasn't going to break his own laws, though. He's <laughs> uh, a little smarter than these people. Um, so, we're not going to read all this, but sometimes people use these verses of the Bible to say that we should never talk to anyone about their sin. They might say that it is unkind or unloving to say that someone is what to, to say that something someone is doing is wrong. Um, but Jesus speaks plainly about sins. Um, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault. So if someone does something wrong, you can tell them. Um, just between the two of you, if they listen, you've won them over. That's awesome. If they won't listen, take one or two other people with. Um, so that, you know, every, every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Uh, what does Jesus say about telling someone about their sins? Do it. Do it. Yeah. Does he say gossip about people, though? No. No, he doesn't. So if, if, what, what's at the heart then? Why do we tell people about their sins? Christian? So they're trying to change if they listen to you. Yeah, yeah. And if they do change, if they say, you know, I'm sorry, I have sinned, what do we get to tell them? So if someone uh, came and they stole money from me and I found out and I said, hey, you stole from me, that's wrong. And they said, I'm so sorry. I've sinned against God. What do we get to tell them, Emma? Yeah, we forgive them and God forgives them. Absolutely. Um, what does Jesus say? Basically, yes, tell people their sins. The hope is, of course, that they repent. Um, we talked about repentance. What does Jesus say? We should talk to people about their sins in a loving way to try to lead them to repentance. You can write this one down, the whole thing. We should talk to people about their sins in a loving way to try to lead them to repentance. What do you make of Jesus saying if they refuse to listen to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector? What does that mean? Uh, Any ideas? Gabe, go for it. Uh, like, to everybody treating them as, like, bad people, I guess, like, below everybody else in society, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, just the like the idea of being a tax collector was just bad and like every tax collector was bad basically like everyone said that and it's just it was just a general idea of what a bad person looked like back then i guess mm -hmm. so what, what do you think about jesus telling us to treat people like that um ignore them i guess ignore them okay Gabe Amerson, you got your hand up? You want to throw your opinion into the ring? Like, you treat them like they're a bad person or they've done something bad. 
And how do we treat people who've done something bad? We just stop respecting them. We don't respect them, but God tells us to love everyone. Yeah, I know. Should I explain to you how we talk about this passage? Yes, I shall. Okay, so if you come to someone who has joined a church, joined our church, let's say, and um, let's pick a sin. Let's say that they have been, um, they have been having sex with someone who's not their spouse. And you find out. So you tell them, hey, this is not what God wants you to do. Uh, this is a sin. And they say, nope, I don't care about you. I don't care what you tell me. So you go with a few other people and you talk to them about it and they still say, nope, I don't care. And eventually the, the church intervenes and says, hey, uh, right now you're not going to take communion because you're living in sin. And they still say, nope, I'm not living in sin. Um, I can do whatever I want. Eventually they wouldn't be members at our church anymore. They would be like a pagan or a tax collector. You remember Jesus? He has dinner with these tax collectors and pagans and the prostitutes. He loves the low lifes, right? He goes to Zacchaeus's house. We heard that. Um, I don't know if any of you here were here for Thanksgiving Eve. Never mind. Uh, that was the gospel lesson for Thanksgiving Eve, though. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. Jesus comes to his house and Zacchaeus repents. He says, if I've cheated anyone, I'm going to give it all back. I'm going to donate to the poor. And Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. Yeah. So we treat people who are living in sin like they're unbelievers. We care about unbelievers, though. We're friends with unbelievers. You probably have people who you're friends with who don't believe in Jesus as their savior. Yeah. And our goal is to love them, to, to bring them into a relationship with God through his word. Uh, we still care about the pagans. We still care about the tax collectors. Now we're not going to say, oh, let's go up to communion together with our friend who's an unbeliever. But we'll say, hey, let's go to church. Let, let's learn about God's word. And somebody who doesn't listen to the Bible is saying, hey, well, well let's, let's go and hear what it says. Uh, does that make a little more sense? Awesome. Yeah, I know. I, I knew I was going to get someone by asking those questions. So thanks for playing along and letting me explain this to you. Um, and Jesus does still tell this woman, stop sinning. Leave your life of sin. Now we get to 1 John 1, 8 through 10. Is this ringing any bells? Yes. Might might anyone know this passage? I hope you do, because in a little bit, we're going to write it down. Uh, but for now, we're just going to talk about the concept. So someone can read it off the screen. This is review of memory work. We must take sin seriously as Jesus did. If we claim that we aren't sinners or that our sins don't matter, we are unrepentant. We are not repenting. Uh, in 1 John 1, 8 through 10, what does John say is true about us if we are unrepentant? Let's read the verse first. Who will read for us? Zila, are you still with us online? Will you read this one for us? Yes. Thank you. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Thank you very much. What does John say is true if we are unrepentant? Gabe? The truth's not in us. The truth's not in us. Absolutely. Yep. And if we don't repent, we don't have that forgiveness of sins and that purity from all unrighteousness. We're, we're stuck living in unrighteousness. You can write this one down. Number eight, we lie to ourselves and call God a liar. We 
lie to ourselves when we call God a liar. We've got two terms, unrepentant or impenitent. Someone who is not sorry for his or her sins and does not want to change. You can write this down. This may or may not be in the test. Someone who is not sorry for his or her, for his or her sins and does not want to change. Finger on your nose when you got it written down. Yeah, can I just read one? Yeah, go ahead. So this is unrepentant. Um, no, let's, let's look back up at the screen then. What does God promise to do if we confess our sins to him? What does God say if we confess our sins, if we do repent? What do we hear? We are forgiven. Yeah, we're forgiven. We're purified from all unrighteousness. He forgives us. So number nine, he forgives us. He forgives us. If we do confess our sins, we are repentant. Repentant or penitent is defined as such, someone who is sorry for his or her sins and wants to stop sinning. We can write this one down. Someone who is sorry for his or her sins and wants to stop sinning, repentant. So go ahead, write it down. It might be on the test. Welcome back, Alan. Yeah, I see that you got kicked out. Sorry, I didn't let you back in right away. Welcome back. So we're on uh, the key term, repentant. Someone who is sorry for his or her sins and wants to stop sinning. We know that we're when we are repentant, that forgives our sins. Pretty awesome. Good, good. All right, we, this section, we're talking about the keys. The keys are the ability that God gives his church to either forgive someone their sins or to tell them that God has not forgiven them. Um, basically, we get to decide whether or not someone is repentant and um, we proceed from there. So we've got the binding key and the loosing key. That's what they're called, kind of interesting names. The binding key, what do you think the binding key is? Gabe? Um, someone that can uh, just block your path to heaven, I guess. Okay, yeah, it's um, binding you to your sins. Binding is like uh, being wrapped with something. So you get, you're stuck in your sins, you're not forgiven. Um, that's the binding key or the locking key. And then we also have the loosing key or the unlocking key. What do we think that one is? Max, what do you think? When you forgive someone? Yeah, when you forgive someone. Absolutely. It's kind of weird talking about keys 
But that's how the Bible talks about it. That's how Jesus talks and about it. Like keys that open up your front door. Yeah, except it's the keys that open up forgiveness. Pretty cool. Um, this is what the unlocking key is, the loosing key. The duty to assure someone who is repentant that his or her sins are forgiven. You can write that one down. Unlocking key. Again, another term that this one's probably going to be on the test. So you're going to want to know this. The duty to assure someone who is repentant that his or her sins are forgiven. All right, that's the unlocking key. Now let's get to the locking key. The duty to declare to someone who is unrepentant that his or her sins are not forgiven. You can write this one down. The duty to declare someone who is unrepentant that his or her sins are forgiven. All right. Awesome. We're going to breeze through the rest of this. Um, so we use the unlocking key when someone repents. When they say, oh, I'm sorry for my sins. You say, I forgive you. Or when you tell someone, hey, you're, you're sinning right now. And they say, I don't care. You say, hey. Um, you're on the fast track to hell if you keep living a life of unbelief. Uh, you, you basically warn them that they should repent. Um, and God gives us the task of doing this, of telling each other that we're forgiven. Um, and he especially gives that task to pastors and teachers who uh, get to tell us that were forgiven publicly. Um, and now let's get to. So when when might it be useful or beneficial to confess your sins directly to a pastor when a sin is really troubling you, and you get personal forgiveness? Because um, if you say that you're sinning, we can assure you that you're forgiven. All right, let's get to homework. For next time, we've got the keys, the second part. Keys number two, second part. Let me find a page number for you as well. That's on page 333. Uh, it is 10.09. So for next time, keys, second part on page 333 of the catechism, and we're going to study for the test. And remember, sermon notes. You're all taking sermon notes today. I don't know if you knew this, but yeah, you should um, all take sermon notes. Oh, I got some. Second that. part is really confusing. I got one. Like the second question is a sermon note. It's just like I, I literally know. I got one done. Thanks, Max. Is your name on it? Yes. Awesome. Um, what sin or sins do the Bible? No, not, okay, I guess not that one, but like maybe like this. I don't remember which question. Oh, sermon theme and parts. Yeah. So in the bulletin, it's the highlighted thing. Um, it's in bold. Today, it's like King Jesus brings light. Let's live in that light. That's all you'd write down. Um, oh, wait, I need that. Okay, so this, now you can close everything else up. Close everything up. Close your Bibles. It's that time. Take that white piece of paper. Oh, no, no, no. We're sitting down. We're doing memory work. Oh. Sorry. It's memory work time. You're going to write your name. 
at the top, everyone start by writing your name, because if you don't write your name, then I won't know who you are. Okay. And then you're going to write first John 189 and the keys first. And if you don't know it, well, you can explain to me why you don't know it, I guess. Or something like that. You should know it, because it, last time we had a class, you told me you would know it. Remember we did that whole thing where I said, you're going to repeat after me, I will learn first John 189, and so I will learn first John 189. You're going to do that now. So go ahead. I am giving the first few words. It's very generous and gracious. First John 189. If you are online, go ahead and type this into the chat to the best of your ability. Make sure you write your name on the top. I don't know who it is. And then you're going to write First John one eight through nine. You can at least get the first five words. Every single one of you, even if you haven't learned this at all, because it's literally on the screen. So turn around and look at the screen if you need to. Get the first few words. And if you don't know it, you can explain why you don't know it, because we said we would know it. It's 10.15, but we're going to keep writing, okay? we got like five more minutes. I'm just going to slowly start getting ready for church, so don't be alarmed. Keep going. we got time.
other part because I got back from Florida at 10 30 last night. So you can write that down. Then. I don't know this because I got back there from Florida. requires honesty. Thank you, Celo. That's that's uh, that's John one eight and nine. Which is different than first John one eight and nine. Thank you. Bill. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, thank you for, for writing what you did know, though. I appreciate that. All right, folks online, take care. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.